morning, everyone. My name is Betty Hager Francis, and I am Deputy County Manager for Health, Human Services, and Education in the office of County Executive Rashern Baker. And uh, Mr. Baker will be here momentarily, but in the interest of time, we're going to get started. Um, we have with us this evening our, the chair of the Board of Education, Dr. U, uh, Dr. Segun Eubanks, and the Chief Executive Officer of Prince George's County uh, Schools, Dr. Kevin Maxwell. We have an, a number of other distinguished guests with us. Um, Senator Paul Pinsky. <laughs> Council Member Danielle Glaros. <laughs> Former uh, Council Matic District 3 uh, Council Member Eric Olson. <laughs> Took me a minute to get that out. Excuse me. Uh, we have Kenneth Haynes, who is the president of Prince George's County Educators Association. We also have our deputy superintendent, Dr. Mon Monique Whittington Davis. And our director of public safety, um, Barry Stanton was here, and our chief administrative Officer Nicholas Majette, right there in the back. We thank you all so much for joining us this evening as we get started with this important conversation about right-sizing our county's investment in our children and in our schools. Before we begin, I'd like to ask Senator Pinsky to bring us greetings and a few remarks. Uh, thank you, Betty. Uh, thank you. I'm very pleased everyone is out today. Welcome to the 22nd District and all of you live here anyway. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm filling in for my good friend Rashern, uh, who's in, in route, and I'm, whether I'm supposed to do song and dance, which you'd, this place would empty very quickly if I did that. Um, but I do want to welcome our guest. As many of you know, uh, Kevin Maxwell was the principal at Northwestern. Uh, he actually started teaching in Prince George's County at Crossland High School and grew up in Bladensburg, so he really is one of our own and homegrown, and we're glad to have him back in Prince George's County. And uh, Sagun Eubanks, who many of you don't know, is a great dynamic person who's been in the field of education for many years. We won't age us too much today. Um, I've been to one or two others of these where the county executive who has made this proposal of uh, increasing the... Um, a number of uh, taxes to pay for education. Um, and as many people will say, it's a bold move whether you like it or, or don't. And he has been actively with the people in front of you going out to the communities, to schools, to PTAs, to parent groups, civic associations, trying to explain the issue. And as you'll hear in a moment, they're going to take your questions and he usually promises to stay until all questions are answered. So uh, with that, I'm going to get out of the way uh, but again, thank you, and uh, we're still fighting in Annapolis. There's another $20 million that's still up for grabs, which should have been funded by the governor, uh, but has not yet been done. Uh, that's called the GCEI, the uh, Geographic Cost of uh, Education Index, which has been funded for many, many years, but could cost the state $68 million, but Prince George's County $20 million, which is, is very serious indeed, and we're still trying to pressure him uh, unfortunately, it's under his purview and not under the budget itself. So um, he has some flexibility. So we'll find out about that probably in the next uh, week to 10 days. So with that, Betty, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator Pensky. Before we go on, I'd like to recognize Terry Bacote Charles, who will be uh, speaking with us this evening about budget matters. Uh, Terry, you want to stand up and let everybody know who you are? And our former budget director is back there, Doug Brown, who we haven't seen in a long time. <laughs> uh, 
So we have with us a council member, as I said, council member uh, Danielle Glaros, who will bring us greetings. Thank you, appreciate it. And thank you all for coming out tonight. I know you have a lot going on um, in your lives, so I appreciate you taking the time out. Um, I think as many of you know, um, the county council is in the midst of um, looking at the budget proposal that the county executive has sent down to us. Um, we're scheduled to make that decision on May 28th. We have to do that by June 1st. Um, so that is, I believe, a few weeks away um, from us. Um, I will be back at um, University Park um, speaking to your town council on Monday night about the budget, both the education portion, but also the broader budget. So if you have additional questions after tonight, feel free to um, talk to me about those on Monday night or um, email me. Um, I think most of you have my email, but um, if you don't, um, please go just Google me and you can find it. It's dmglaros at co.pg.md.us. And um, my, uh, my phone number is 301-952-3060. And uh, please ask all your questions. I've had a chance to interact with both of these gentlemen. Um, Dr. Maxwell joined me for my town hall um, in April and answered a bunch of questions as well from the audience. And um, I'm, um, I am pleased to say that um, I know we've had a lot of turnover with our superintendents over the last few years. I'm pretty confident Dr. Maxwell will be here for a while. In fact, he was asked that question in a committee meeting. So one of my colleagues in a committee meeting, we've been doing a lot of budget sessions. I think this week alone, I've probably been in four or five budget sessions. Last week, I might have reviewed 11 different agency budgets. Um, that is what I'm spending my time doing right now on behalf of all of you who um, uh, elected me. And uh, Dr. Maxwell, um, in essence, said he would be here for... Um, at least the next three or four years, I believe, is what she said. But um, until the job's done, how about I say that? Did you want to say something, Dr. Maxwell? So my goal is two four-year terms. That's my goal. And I'm, ha I'm almost halfway through my first term, so that would be about another six years uh, is, the, is the right now goal. All right. So another six years. I sound corrected. All right. I'm going to turn the speaker back over. Thank you very much, Councilmember Glaros. And I would like to also thank our wonderful principal, <laughs> Toy Davis, and the entire staff of University Park Elementary School for hosting tonight's conversation. And now Mrs. Davis is going to bring us some, some brief remarks and some comments. Good evening and welcome to University Park Elementary School. Um, I am Toy Davis and I am the very proud principal of University Park Elementary School where students are soaring to new heights with unity, pride, excellence, and success daily. In addition to being a principal of Prince George's County Public School, I am also a resident of Prince George's County and a parent of children who attend Prince George's County Public Schools. Tonight's forum is multi-purpose for me as I am eager to learn how the proposed budget benefits me as a resident of Prince George's County Schools, I'm sorry, of Prince George's County, how it will benefit my own children, but more importantly, as the principal of University Park, I'm eager to learn how the proposed budget will benefit our children and staff as well. Our county executive and our CEO have developed a strategic plan for our school system, which is the promise of 2020. Should this proposed budget become a reality, the increased revenues would go directly to our schools to support our children and staff in profound ways. I have prepared a few points to share how this proposed budget could impact University Park. Uh, the children and staff of University Park will gain significant additional resources in our school's general budget and an increase of almost $100,000. There will be additional funding for digital literacy in grades three through five, which means we can purchase additional laptops, iPads, or e-readers for students in those grade levels to decrease the digital divide between our school and other schools in the state. We would also receive additional funding for professional development for staff, 
This funding will directly support our teachers as we continue to implement the Common Core and other instructional initiatives. Additionally, the proposed funding will provide an allocation for a TAG resource teacher to ensure our TAG program exceeds the county and state standards for our students and support our school as we continue the process to acquire eGate certification. And furthermore, the additional funds will allow University Park to continue our universal breakfast program, which ensures that no student at University Park Elementary School goes without food. And with a farms rate of 57%, I cannot tell you how thankful we are as a school and a community for the opportunity to receive additional funding to continue our breakfast program. So in closing, Many of you are aware that we have some of the best teachers at University Park Elementary School who put children first, who instruct at high levels, and engage and connect with our community in a way unlike no other. They ensure that we have an outstanding academic program and that academic achievement is available for all students and that at University Park Elementary School, we are truly great by choice. So the promise of 2020 will provide additional support for our school and every school in Prince George's County Public Schools, providing the necessary and much needed resources that our children and my children so rightly deserve. Thank you. What a wonderful statement that was. Fantastic. And um, uh, our Board Chair, uh, Dr. Eubanks, would you bring us a, a few words, please? Sure. Good evening, colleagues and friends and citizens. What a great evening to be here in Prince George's County. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, the Board of Education of Prince George's County has uh, uh, deliberated greatly on our strategic plan and budget. Uh, the Board of Education, there are 14 of us. We represent you, whether elected or appointed. We are a diverse group, just like the uh, the the citizens of our county. We have teenagers, we have retirees, we have educators, we have uh, community workers, we have business people. We're a diverse group of folks who come together on your behalf uh, to do what's right for the citizens of this great county and the students we serve. When we started this process, you know, and, and I myself, I'm, uh, I'm a parent uh, of, of two students in the system, one who graduated last year, and another who is a junior at Suitland High School. Uh, so I'm deeply committed to the public education system in Prince George's County. In addition to that, I've spent the last 35 years of my career working in, in education. I work for the National Education Association in Washington, D.C., and have spent uh, uh, all of my career uh, focusing on issues of equity, of diversity, and of social justice in education. Uh, so we bring the, when we started this journey, we knew, we, we get around this table and we hear everything that, that there is to hear about our county school system. And we were facing two competing realities as we looked at what we want to do with our future. The first is that our school system is far better than most people perceive it to be. We have a serious perception problem in Prince George's County public schools. Far too many times what's in the newspaper, all, this, all the bad stories, Every time a kid misses a bus, it's in the news. Every time there's a fight, it's in the news. We see that often. What we don't see nearly enough of are our students and the millions of dollars of scholarships that they've earned, of the community service that they do, of the greatness that our parents who come in and engage with our system do. So we know that we have a, a tremendous perception problem. We are a darn good school system. Our second reality, however, is that we're good, but we're not good enough. We know that Prince George's County Public Schools offers a first-class education to many, many of our graduates and, offer, and offers a great education and a good education to most. But for far too many, the education that they're getting isn't good enough for them to compete in a global society. Far too many of our students aren't getting the skills that they need to be successful, contributing members of our community. We knew that to turn that around, we needed to do something significant. And our goal that we gave to our CEO was simple but powerful. 
We said, Dr. Maxwell, we know we have good schools and we need to be great. What our goal is, isn't that University Park Elementary is great, but the elementary school down at the South County, not so much. We know we gotta change that paradigm. If you're parents in the system, you know it and you've heard it a thousand times. I love my elementary school, but I don't know about that middle school. If I get a lottery and get into specialty program, I'm good, but I don't know about my neighborhood school. If I get into Roosevelt, I'm in good shape. If I go anywhere else, I don't know. We've all heard it. Our goal is simple. We want to offer a great education to every student in every school every single day. It's something that we know can be done because it's happening around us, right here in this great state of Maryland. Maryland is the, the number one performing state in the nation. We've seen great education all around us. And we say, why not us? We look at the students and the, and the families we serve and the citizens we serve, and we say, why don't we deserve greatness? So when we, put, when we charged Dr. Maxwell with the strategic plan and budget, which he's gonna talk about in more detail, our, our charge was simple. A great education for every student in every school, every single day. We know to do that, we need to make an investment uh, of time, resources, and energy. It's both money and it's culture that needs to change. We know money alone can't do it. We must change our culture, we must change our actions, we must change our mindset, and we're in the process of doing that as well. So I'm looking forward to a great session with you and answering any questions that you have, and I'll turn it over and let's uh, get things started. Thank you so much, Dr. Eubanks. So I'll be serving as your moderator this evening. Um, and before we begin, I want to let you know that um, as you came in, um, many of you, I would say probably most of you, um, completed a card with your questions or comments or concerns on the card. We're going to go through every single question, comment, or concern. In the interest of time, we won't repeat the same question over and over again. That doesn't make sense. So we will just, we'll ask the same question. If there's a variation on the question, we'll get to the variation on the question. But we will stay here until every single question and concern about this budget is, is answered. Now, on a, on a side note, we have folks out here, um, to the left, who are from our county click office, our 311 office, and if you have any concerns or questions about anything else in the Prince George's County government, please let those folks know and you'll get a response. It'll be entered into our 311 system and you'll get a, you'll get a good response. So before uh, we begin, our, our real discussion. I just want to give you a brief background about why we're actually here tonight. In March of this year, County Executive Baker announced his 2016 budget proposal, which includes a dramatic increase in funding for Prince George's County Public Schools, which will be funded in part by an increase in property taxes. I want you to know right up front, though, that senior citizens and those with a lower income will not be affected by this property tax. And that's gonna be described to you in further detail as we proceed this evening. The historic investment in our schools of over $130 million is intended to move our school system from consistently being ranked 23rd out of 24th to the top 10 by 2020. This rapid improvement of our, of our school system will occur as a result of implementing the new strategic plan of the Prince George's County Public School as has been uh, mentioned previously. This tax increase is gonna require some sacrifice from every one of us who live in Prince George's County. It's an increase of 15 cents in the real property tax rate, an increase of 38 cents in the personal property tax rate, and a 4% increase in the telecommunications tax. But it's for our children, and our children in Prince George's County are certainly worth it. With that background, 
I want to tell you that Mr. Baker is here. We're ready to begin uh, the question and answers. Um, but I think that what we should do is probably get started um, with our first question because it will be for Dr. Maxwell. Dr. Maxwell, this seems like, Dr. Maxwell, <laughs> this seems like a, a chicken and egg problem. A higher property tax rate is, is necessary because property values are lower than in other jurisdictions. Property values are lower because the schools are challenged. How do you assume um, to convince people um, that the funds are going to be used efficiently when mismanagement has plagued the school system? What are our assurances? So, so I, I guess, I'm not, I'm not sure about the chicken and the egg part, but I think that you know, part of our strategic plan, the organizational effectiveness part, is all around doing what we're supposed to do and doing it better. So, so those are organizational efficiencies. How do we really run the school system and make sure that we're doing what we need to do? So we're looking very carefully at the audits that the state does, for example. We look very carefully at the audits that our auditors and the board auditors do. We make sure where those, uh, uh, I guess, improvements need to be made in the use of funds. But it's important also to understand that there's a lot of scrutiny of the school system. And while certainly I won't argue that there have been some issues with management over the years, the reality is that we have to do our budget by a bunch of different state categories. They're monitored by the state by each category. We don't just have to balance our budget by the bottom line, but by each one of those categories that are laid out by the state. So the State Department of Education audits our books as well as a bunch of other people. The state uh, legislature does a, I think it's every three year uh, audit of our school system and makes sure that, that we are doing what it is that we're supposed to do. Our, our plan is on the website. So I didn't, you know, if you go to the Prince George County Public School website, if you go there's a, whole, there's a bunch of information there, and if you haven't looked at it, I encourage you to do that. But it spells out exactly what we intend to use these funds for. Every single category that's on there under each of the areas of the strategic plan, actually each of the first four, because the last one, organizational effectiveness, has no funds attached to it. But we started this conversation last year by bringing in a bunch of outside experts to work with our folks, the transition team. That report is on there, too gave us a lot of insight and direction into the kinds of things we should be looking at and doing. As we began to develop the strategic plan, we did internal and external uh, stakeholder surveys to get some additional insight and information. And then we crafted uh, a plan. And we've been working with the University of Maryland uh, data people to work on data points uh, that, to make sure that we're measuring the right things to get to uh, what we're, where we're trying to go, what we're trying to achieve, and we're, we're hoping to have most of those data points ready for us uh, in, the, in the next uh, four, five, six weeks as we get ready to transition into the next school year. So we've been trying to use outside resources uh, to make sure that we're, we're getting an independent look you know, at that information. So I would say Dr. Dukes uh, of the community college and Dr. Lowry chaired the um, transition team when we came in last year. And we've been using, as I said, the University of Maryland and others as uh, resources for us to help us make sure that we're really on target with what our thinking is. Uh, we also are using a school system uh, improvement program, which works with schools, but also the divisions within the school. That work is called DataWise, and it's a way of uh, developing a way of thinking and culture within the organization about getting the right results. Uh, it originated out of Harvard. And we began using some of those folks as consultants last year and have actually uh, decided that it's actually cheaper to hire a couple of them. So we, we actually have them on staff now uh, doing training. And so they're meeting with each division, you know, from facilities to schools uh, to, to HR, uh, making sure that we're doing the right work. When we reorganized uh, human resources last year, we used another outside group to come in and help us with the organizational structure, the interviews, to make sure that we had experts in the field sitting on our right and on our left, making sure 
that the decisions that we make are the right ones to make. So, so I think that the other assurances, I mean, one part of this plan is academic achievement, but they're all integrated. And I don't want to spend too much time talking about it because I'm sure I'm going to get a bunch of questions. But the academic achievement pieces, that improvement has to come through the highly performing, the high performing workforce, through the uh, safe and supportive school environments, all of that stuff works together. So it's not like you can say, okay, well, we'll do this part, but we won't do that part. Because if you don't have the high quality staff that you need, then you can't really get to the academic achievement that you want to have your kids. And I'll, and I'll use one data point, it may come up later in the thing, but we have, we have about 9,600 teachers in our school district right now. I want that number to sink in for a minute, 9,600 teachers. Since the 2007-8 school year, we've hired 7,100 teachers. Now, there aren't many organizations that can turn over that much in such a short period of time, right? And so we need, you know, when I say the high-performing workforce, we need the mentor teachers and we need the professional developers and we need to be able to stop the drain that we have on teachers who we know, after working for us, seven or eight years are making, depending on the salary lane they're on, between ten and fifteen thousand dollars a year less than they could make if they're in Montgomery County, as an example. And so we compete with the large districts in Maryland. We don't have a lot of competition from the small districts in the state that have twenty two hundred kids smaller than some of our high schools. But the big districts around here, uh, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Montgomery County, Fairfax County, DC, they're big competitors of ours and they're all looking for large numbers of teachers. And so you know, I'm not saying that we need to pay more than Montgomery County does, but we need to be a lot closer than we are right now uh, if we're going to not have, you know, several percent every year who go there, plus the ones that you have with natural retirements and turnovers. Um, and, and again, to be competitive, you know, we got to be at least in the ball game. Thank you so much, Dr. Maxwell. Um, I would like to introduce our county executive who has joined us who is the author of this, what has been called extremely bold budget proposal and our convener this evening. And I'd also like to recognize Delegate Tawana Haynes, who has joined us. And <laughs> Mr. Baker, I have a question for you, unless you'd like to. I'm ready, I'm for, ready. The, ready for your question. Section 813 of the charter approved by 70% of voters. Why are you not letting voters approve new taxes? Sorry, what, what was that again? Why are you not letting voters approve new taxes, Mr. Baker? <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, we get this question a lot, and that was, you know, how did I come up with this that I can actually go around trim? Because what the question is saying, how can I go around trim? You know, first and foremost, let's just say this. The legislation came from Annapolis. Believe this or not, the legislation did not have Rashawn Baker's name on it. Did it, Tawana? Remember in 2012? All 24 jurisdictions. I didn't even know the legislation was there. But what it did say was that jurisdictions that had tax cap, believe me, and Doug Brown can tell you in the back, we're not going above trim, because we could, I could actually use taxes to help with the other side of the budget. Because the other side of the budget that we gave to Councilmember Galeros has 110 people, actual taxpayers of Prince George's County, who pay mortgages, 110 fired to balance our budget. Five days of furloughs. Every department of this government of yours cut by 5%. So if I could go above trim, I could actually deal with some of those issues. The police department, the fire department, you've been watching budget hearings, they all mad. They want to know why can't they get some money and why can't they use this money? Well, they can't. Because what the legislature gave us the authority to do was for education is the only place we can raise taxes to go there. So why can I do it? Because the legislature allowed us to do it. And the last time, you know, I've was in law school a long, long time ago, and I think it's still the same. State law trumps local law. And the reason they came up with it, quite honestly, was because everybody around the, around the region, let's start with over here, Calvert County pays 58% of their local funds into their school system. Anne Arundel County 
59% of their money into the, into the school system. Montgomery County, 66% of their money into the school system. Howard County, 69%. Not my figures, their figures. Prince George's County, 35%. The 55% comes from guess who? The state. Guess who the state is? Howard County, Montgomery County, Anne Arundel County, Calvert County. So what the state decided to do is, great, everybody cares about education. We're now going to give you a chance, not just Prince George's County, but other jurisdictions that have a tax cap. We're going to give you a chance to use your local dollars to put into your school system. So the reason we can do this is because the state said, guess what? We want you to contribute to your local school system just like everybody else is doing. Because guess what? The state ain't giving us a whole bunch of money. We're fighting now to have them release the money of what is it, about $20 million? $20 million? Or GCI. We don't know if the governor is going to give that to us or not. Do we know, Tawana, we get an answer? Not sure. Ask him again today. Because what they're signaling to us is if we want to have the best school system in the state, then we're going to have to do what the other jurisdictions are doing. We're going to have to put our money in. So that's what they did. They came to us and said, guess what? You get to fund your school system. And guess who gets to make that decision? Your representatives, the nine members of the county council. One was here. Nine members of the county council. And how we came up with 15 cents, because I know that question probably came up. Someone will know, did I just pull 15 cents out of the air? Nope, didn't do it. Didn't pull 15 cents out of the air. What I said to Dr. Maxwell, if you're going to do this, if you're going to ask taxpayers to go into their pocket and to pay more, especially property taxes, which are regressive taxes, only less regressive than sales tax, if you're going to do that, then we need to be able to show people that their investment is going to pay off. Yes, you could go in for three cents, which will take you from 23 to 21. If you're going to do this, because you're only going to get a chance to do it once, if you're going to do it, it needs to be an amount that one will move us up. Because even with the 15 cents that we're saying, we 100% goes to the school system, 100% to the school system. 100% to the school system. Doug Brown, can I use this money for anything else? No. School system, would you like some more money when you were in the government helping us? Yes. Can hit. 100% goes to them. The 15 cents, if we got it all, will still mean that we're putting 703, I think it is, million dollars, correct me if I'm wrong, 703 million dollars into our school system from Prince George's County. Montgomery County puts how much of their money into our school system, into their school system? 1.2 billion. Even with this, we're still behind. I would love it if we didn't have to do it. If I could print money, I would do it. If the governor would give me money, I would do it. Because I don't get excluded from the property tax either. But yes, they gave us the right to do it because they gave us the right to help ourselves. Any statement, or did I answer the question? I think it was a combination of both. <laughs> and we've been joined by Delegate Ann Healy. <laughs> and by our Chief of Staff, Glenda Wilson. <laughs> and Mr. Baker, because you asked me to, to, to make every question or comment known, this is one that is a little difficult. This is from uh, one of the persons who um, asked the last question. I'm moving to Delaware if the tax increase is approved. I love Prince George's, but I deserve to afford my home. Hello. I'm sorry you're moving to Delaware. We really want you to stay. But what... I think we want to do for you, though, is to figure out how your property value rises. I know you don't want to pay any more. Believe me, believe me, I don't either. I don't want to pay any more taxes. But I'd like the biggest investment I'm going to make to rise in value. 
It's not going to happen unless you have a quality school system. If we could do it by reducing crime, Eric Olson, we did that. Crime went down significantly, 36% over the four years when Eric was on the council when we were here. Crime went down, 36%, one of the largest drops. Economic development, he can tell you about it, $6 billion worth of economic development are going to happen in Prince George's County over the next four years. Six billion. Probably more than any other place at one time in the state of Maryland. We're building a brand new hospital system. Thank you, Tawana. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ann. $650 million around a metro station, which will increase our value. We're doing everything that we can to bring commercial tax base here so we can even it out. But guess what? You know what the biggest stumbling block? And I say this all the time. I went to Dave and Buster's, which I've been crying for Dave and Buster's since my kids were small. Because I didn't want to take Rashern over to Silver Spring or wherever, Waldorf, wherever the heck it was. I said, why can't we have one here? So when I became county executive, I said, I'm getting a Dave and Buster's. Busters. We deserve that in the county. Went to Dave and Buster's in Las Vegas. They said, I ain't coming to Prince George's County. I was like, you got to be kidding me. No. Chased them around the world. You know why? Because the first thing they said is, why would I invest money? Because that's an investment in a place that we don't think is going to be rise in value over the next 10 to 20 years. We got them here. But God, we had to use, is David Iannucci here? We had to go hunt them down with EDI fund incentives to move into a county where disposable income is the same as our surrounding jurisdictions. Why? Because of one thing, the reputation. When they said Prince George's County is not a good place to invest, they weren't talking about crime. They weren't talking about health care. They were talking about the school system. When they said Anne Arundel County is a great place to invest, they weren't talking about crime. They wasn't talking about health care. They were talking about their school system. That's your reputation. So I want your housing to go up in value. And the only way I can do that is to figure out how we move ourselves in our public school system, not just in one part of our county, not just in one school or one elementary school, but throughout all 500 square miles. That's the commitment I made as county executive. That throughout wherever you move in this great county, you're going to be able to put your child, so if you choose, into a public school system. And more importantly, when people read about Prince George's County, the quality of our school system says that's a great place to invest. You want to know why we're not competing with Marriott coming here? That's why. They didn't even put us on the list. We got space. It's your school system. So yes, I don't want you to move to Delaware. I want you to stay here. But I want your houses to go up in value. Thank you, Mr. Baker. We're joined by Delegate Alonzo Washington. The next question is, what provisions will be made for people with a limited income? And uh, Terry Bacot Charles is here, too, it, to assist us. If I say anything wrong, Terry will correct me, right, Terry? She's our budget lady. By the way, Terry, you have any extra money in your pockets? No, any pump, empty pockets. So what provision we've looked at, and actually this is one of the things we've found um, because of these roundtable discussions. Uh, when we introduced, when we sent the bill down to the council, we excluded seniors um, that had the home tax credit, homestead tax credit. We ex excluded seniors and household incomes of $60,000. What we found is maybe the $60,000 is too low. Maybe we should look at raising it to 70 and see what that does um, in terms of what's catching. So one, we're looking at that amount, that it's, so we capture families that this is impacting. The other thing is we found out that a number of our households in Prince George's County, maybe not in this area, but throughout the county, that a number of the households actually should be qualifying for the home Stead tax credit, the, the, the state's homestead tax credit, but they're not applying for it. So there are some people who are, who are coming up to us at these hearings and saying, I can't afford this. I'm going to make a choice between medicine 
and paying my property taxes. And when we look up their address and look up their income, they actually should be qualifying. So yes, we are looking at that to make it as least impactful as possible. It's also the reason we emphasize the 15 cents. The 15 cents becomes important because some places in Prince George's County will pay less. Some places, and we're in one of those areas, will pay more. Some places will pay less. Some places will pay more. It is not, doesn't hit everyone equally across. There are some areas they'll pay eight cents. And there are some areas they'll pay 16 cents. If you're in Fort Washington, in some of those areas, you're gonna pay around 16, 16 cents or 17 cents. So um, we are looking at that and that's one of the areas that we wanna make sure that we, as least impactful as possible, with still making sure we have the resources for the school system to do what it needs to be done. What is the average SAT score for Maryland's top 10 school districts? How do you propose getting our students from just under a score of 1,200 to the new top 10 average score? I think that's you, Doc. Might be Dr. Davis. So, so uh, the average, I don't have it for each of the 10 districts. The average state SAT score, if I'm correct, is 1420. And we're a couple hundred points behind that at 1197 as an average. And so the whole, the plan, and then again, I can go through all the different parts, but it's a, it's a, a plan that begins with the, the graduation rate, SATs and those things in plan with, uh, we've talked about literacy coaches. Literacy and our definition in the strategic plan is both numeracy and uh, reading language art skills for kids who are behind. So working with uh, those children providing a literacy coach, we're going to start that rollout in the secondary schools because of uh, PSAT, SAT, uh, and graduation rates, as well as ninth grade promotion rates. Um, we are going to then start in the elementary schools with the gifted specialists that uh, Principal Davis uh, talked about for our, our longer term growth, knowing that we have more kids that can do more rigorous work than we currently have engaged in that work. When, when you look at uh, the plan though, again, part of that is to stop the teacher turnover, to stop the principal turnover, to stabilize things, additional professional development for folks. Uh, as an executive team, our charge is to work on that overall systemic work. And so I will just say very clearly, our executive team has been working with the data wise folks to review uh, the reading language arts portion of the PSAT, the math portion of the PSAT, the writing portion of the PSAT with real questions, real answers, real data and working on strategies and, and developing questions for us as we work through this process. So, so it's not like we're divorced or separated out from this work and just saying, here, we want better test scores. Instead, we're actually engaged in you know, developing that day-to-day -day work. So we just had another session today. It's very helpful, very interesting, and in making sure that, that we're aligning that work. But again, every piece of that strategic plan from the professional develop development uh, improvements, both school-based and central-based, the mentor teachers, the peer assistance and review program, all of that is tied to better performance in classrooms and better performance in schools and better student outcomes. So I think that, you know, again, I talked a little bit earlier about the metrics from the University of Maryland. We're, we're looking at, uh, you know, what are the right data points to make sure that we're moving forward. We are going to begin using the Ready Step program from the College Board. So you probably, many at least in this room, I'm sure know that the PSAT is a predictor and an indicator and gives you a lot of information on SAT scores. The Ready Step is like an eighth and ninth grade program that is aligned with the PSAT and the SAT. So we're rolling backwards into middle school to start working on that. We've also implemented an early warning system, which isn't just exclusive to the PSAT or SAT, but we've been running um, data metrics uh, for our middle school and high school principals and their leadership teams to, to say these kids are 
have these indicators which say they're not likely to be successful moving, for example, from ninth grade into 10th grade. And so we need to develop, you need to develop, we need to develop some interventions for these children so that we're actually really trying to boil that work down to student by student by student. And then the last thing I'll say is working with um, schools to develop some uh, strategies on how they're going to move the population within their school forward uh, in, in improvement. So some schools have kids who are doing pretty well in this area, this subject area, but they need some support in this, and another school may have a different you know, issue. And so we're trying to, again, move it so that we're doing some very targeted professional development work and other kinds of support. Thank you. Can I Oh, I jump in. He may have the number. The, the other part I think is just worth mentioning quickly when it comes to our commitment to excellence. Well, a lot of folks don't know most school districts around, uh, around this area don't do this. Every single one of our juniors takes the SATs. Every single one of our juniors takes the SATs. A lot of other of, uh, jurisdictions don't support making sure that every single one. So we have, we have made a commitment to our challenge that we're not going to shortcut this and only let you know, the kids who are already 100% college bound to take the SAT. We're talking about focusing on making sure that every one of our students graduates with options. And that's, that's really critical to us. And, and the, the work that we're doing in increasing access to AP classes and, 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 and higher level classes in high school is also another key element to that. Did you, some, you guys look like you had numbers, no? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, board member Lupe Grady. What percentage of the residents of Prince George's County send their children to private schools, and what percentage of residents do not have kids in the school system? Yeah. I th that I think, I don't know, Terry, if you know, but it's probably about, roughly about, I don't think it's changed, maybe about 32% send their kids to public schools, um, which I think we're around close, somebody might know better, Kristen, you might know better than I do. We're around the, around the same average, believe it or not, that Montgomery County is. Yeah, so, it, so it's about the, the, the same average. Believe it or not, people actually think more folks from Montgomery County and other places send their kids to public schools uh, than we do. We're about the same average. More, we're, more homeowners and middle class families do, but around the percentage is about the same. Um, the, the difference is the investment. So when you're looking at the investment that they make in their public schools compared to the investment we make, that's where you start seeing the separation. Because what they understand, whether you have people, kids and uh, children in public schools or not, the public school determines the value of your home. Unless you're a city, unless you're D.C., they're the exception to the rule. They get to, because they're D.C., they get to be the exception. Every place else, it really is based on the value and, and, and the ranking of your public school because that's how people judge whether places are good or not. Can Thank I, you. I, it's not, and, it, and it's not just that. We talk, we're so proud. Our, when we talk about our new mission of, of providing a great education to all students and contributing to thriving communities, public education systems contribute to thriving communities. Our graduates need to be tax-paying, contributing citizens uh, and need to make sure that, you know, the, the, what, the stories that you read about our graduates aren't that, you, that, that they aren't in a job market or that they're committing crimes, but that they're contributing to the community in significant ways. So a, an investment in public education is an investment for every citizen, just like, you know, knock on wood, God willing, none of us use the fire department or the police department on a regular basis, but what they do contributes to each and every citizen, regardless of whether you send your kids to public school or private schools, or whether you have kids in the system, the public education system, particularly an excellent one, creates value to the community in countless ways. Thank you. Why can't we wait until the MGM money comes or starts to come in before increasing the county contribution to education funding? 
Good question. I get it all the time. Usually they ask, when, where's the MGM money? It's not here yet. Uh, why can't we wait? Because we're so far behind. Just think about it. We are way behind in the amount of resources we put into our school system. We've been at the bottom of the matrix, or wherever, however you count it, in the state for at least the last 25 years, at least as long as I've been in the generals, I've been involved in public service in the county. We don't want to, and then you don't want to tell people. I know for my, when my children were in school, I didn't want anybody to tell me we had to wait. Just, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be messed up you know, for first grade, but we're going to catch up second grade. You're going to get a cruddy education, but don't worry, it's going to all even out. Somebody actually said that to my wife, and I had to pull her off of them. Don't worry, it's going to even out in third grade. She's like, even out in third grade? No, it's going to even out today. That's how we felt about our children. That's how we should feel about other people's children. If we do the invest, and you've got to do both. If we do the investment in education now, and we start to see the improvements along with the other things we're doing. Just think about it. If we start to move up in education, along with the fact that crime is down, economic development is up, four years from now, we'll really be at the top. Four years from now, you can say, listen, can we lower the property tax, tax value? Yes. Can we lower property tax cap? Yes. You know why? Because we're actually getting money in from commercial. We're actually seeing economic development take place. But you can't do one without the other. The reason I know this is a fact is because people tried it. People know I love Wayne Curry. He was a great friend of mine. His philosophy was, and correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, if we just focus on commercial development and big houses, we'll build ourselves out of this. And that's what he did. And guess what? The market crashed because we were relying on residential property taxes because the one indicator that people were going to invest in the future was education, a good school system because you could sell houses quicker, that business would come there. You have to do both. There is no way around it. If we could do it one way or the other, believe me, I would do it. In fact, if we could do it one way, I'd invest all in education. Because if I improve the school system up a couple of notches, then we got location. We got location. Nobody else has what we have. We have location. You can't buy that. If we improve the education system, everything else will fall into place. But you can't skip on this. This is the most important thing. Thank you. Not all students are wired for higher education. How can a high school graduate today earn enough to support a family and buy a home? Say that one more time. Not all students are wired for higher education. How can a high school graduate today earn enough to support a family and buy a home? So I, I think... Um, I guess my, my take on that answer would be that, you know, the new standards across the country in education are college and career, and there are a lot of, um, you know, jobs that require university training, university certification. There are a lot more that are coming online that require less than a four-year college, a technical um, degree, a technical uh, education, a two-year college degree. Those seem to be evolving pretty quickly. But I would say that, that we want our kids to, to be you know, able to have their own options as they leave. We've been rolling out high school academies across our districts that allow kids to focus on things like hospitality, things like uh, culinary, things like IT, things, things like international baccalaureate, a whole you know, broad, diverse group of choices for kids. Uh, to be able to study and learn about things that they are interested in, that they choose. If you uh, recall, we had President Obama come to Bladensburg High School last year uh, to award, I believe it was six million plus uh, dollars in a labor, a Department of Labor grant for the work that we're doing uh, in that area for Bladensburg, 
Fairmont Heights and Potomac High Schools with the academies that they have. So, so they may not all be wired for college, but I think there are a lot of kids that, that are going to need in today's economy, in today's world, some sort of education afterwards. Part of our strategic plan focuses on uh, measuring uh, kids with the technical certification. So we have kids that are in our IT programs or getting Cisco certification and those kind of things, understanding that that's got to be a part of the offerings. And we still have uh, our traditional, many of us in this room will remember them by the terms of Votech. Uh, you know, we, there are other terms that we use as we go over the years, but I don't know about the last time you ever needed a plumber or needed an electrician, but, you know, they make some pretty decent money and there are, you know, a lot of jobs there and we still have those programs as part of our set of offerings for, for kids as well. Can I jump in too with that? And I, I know exactly what, what the question meant, but I want to push this envelope a little bit. I've been in education for 30 years, 30 plus years, and, and aside from some of my most severely disabled students, I've never met a child not wired for college. I've met thousands of kids who didn't have the opportunity. I met thousands of kids whose parents weren't supportive, whose schools weren't of the highest quality, whose incomes prevented them from giving the access that they needed to go to college. Every student who comes to our doors is wired for success already. The only question is whether we're going to give them a system that is going to allow that potential to come. So what excites us so much about this idea of college and career ready, not every child will choose to go to college. But that's what we want. We want every child ready to do whatever he or she wants. And when they graduate from our system, they can choose whatever that is. If they choose college, or if they choose this lucrative plumbing career, or if they choose whatever else they choose, they're doing that not because they were denied opportunities. They're doing that not because their parents happen to be poor. They're doing that not because they happen to, because of the color of their skin or the language that they speak at home. They're doing that because they choose. A great school system gives every student a choice when they graduate from college, and that's all we're asking us to provide here in Prince George's County. Thank you. How do you propose getting our students from a 76% graduation rate to a 90% graduation rate when exit interviews reveal that students drop out not because they're not smart enough, but because they're bored? So, so I'm, I'm not sure what exit interviews were. I guess maybe that's senior surveys or something. But, but we, you know, we, we came in last year and we didn't just wait for the strategic plan to be finished, but we started working on graduation rate. We looked at data. The data was very clear. Our graduation rate and our ninth grade promotion rates were almost identical. So, so we, we looked at, you know, what kinds of, you know, solutions, what kinds of things, things can we do to intervene in the short term as we develop a long-term plan. So we, um, I mentioned the early warning system earlier where we're giving, you know, here's the list of kids that we really need to be providing some intensive interventions to beginning early in high school, not necessarily in their 12th grade year, but at the same time, we need to be looking at those kids who are beyond ninth grade, headed towards 12th grade that are behind on credits. And so we put in a computer-based credit recovery program in every single one of our high schools last year and began working with those kids to recover credits so that they would have the ability to graduate. Our graduation rate went up almost 2.5% last year alone, and we're about 10 points behind the rest of the state, five years. If we continue to grow at that pace, then we should be able to meet or exceed that state average. We've been talking about 90% because we're assuming a little growth from other districts as, as they go forward. The average right now is 86. But if you look at the average growth of other districts in the state from last year, you know, we think that's a reasonable uh, overall state average for us to, to be looking at. I feel uh, strongly that looking at the correlation, the relationship between the ninth grade promotion rate, we, we had the ninth grade promotion rate uh, increase over 4% last year across the district. So it's even higher than the graduation rate went up. And so those kids are going to be 10th graders um, this year, 11th graders, 12th graders. And so if we, again, if we continue to, to really focus with that laser-like uh, uh, focus on, on that work, I think that we, we are well 
station. I, I know there are people that really are looking at the, you know, those numbers and that 10 points. And personally, I'd have to tell you, again, we, we tried to come out of the gate showing that, that we have some ability to make a difference early. And we feel like we made a down payment on the graduation rate by 2.5% last year and a larger one at over 4% for the rest. I must add, with, with, with uh, groups of children, uh, individual groups that we're also disaggregating around, our special education graduation rate went up 8.02% in one year, 8.02%. Hispanics and African American children went up around four or five percent, I believe, in those categories. The only uh, area where we had any kind of significant de decline was with our international student population, and and we, you know, we're working on that issue. You've first seen some other proposals out there about working on some of those issues and, and graduation, uh, but we feel like we had nearly an across the board increase in graduation rate and ninth grade promotion. You know, I heard the piece about, sorry for not for yelling, I heard the piece around exit surveys. So instead of waiting until students graduate to find out possibly what the problems or concerns were in public education, we are giving yearly surveys to our students as young as kindergarten. Obviously, the kindergarten surveys are being read not by the teacher because we do want to get the children's perception about the teacher, but it is read to them by an adult. And from that data that we're getting yearly, we're using that data in order to inform our professional development. So one of the questions that we're asking students is, are, is your teacher listening to the questions and answering the questions that you have in class? Are you comfortable with asking questions? And from that survey, that we just, I believe, got the information approximately two weeks ago, that's what we're using to inform teachers, hey, listen, our eighth graders are saying this countywide about instruction in our classroom, or more specifically, at University Park, the third graders are saying they want this. And with that information, we're listening to the student voice in order to improve education for all of our students and not waiting until they exit in 12th grade. Wow, that's good information too. Um, next question, how will citizens know that the new funds are actually increasing available services and resources and not replacing money the county wants to redirect out of education to fund other priorities? <laughs> Very good question, I don't know who said that. One of the things we did was, right Terry? Terry, come on up here. This is Terry Bacote Charles, who's our budget director, hi Terry. Um, did we redirect any of our general fund money uh, for, uh, for education? No, we did not. In fact, we, uh, uh, our, sh our children, some of this increase on the other side of the house as well. There you about three to, between three to four million. About three to four million. What that means is we actually did the normal increase that we would do to the school system which is that 1%, 2% that I've done over the last five years, like my predecessors. Um, and, but in order to get that 1% or 2%, we cut. So when I talk about the 110 employees that will actually lose their jobs in this government so that we could balance the structural uh, deficit that we have in the county, that's money. We send it over to schools. When I talk about the fact that the police is not pleased that they have, how many classes? Two or three? They have two. They want three. Guess what? We cut that one class, sent the money to the school system. Fire wanted two. They're getting one. Sent it to the school system. Corrections wanted one. And they're getting? And they're getting? They're getting one, but it's, it's uh, scheduled for the end of the fiscal year. They're getting one, but we're delaying it because we sent the money over there. So that money we sent to the school system, we cut everybody else. And each department head, Barry Stanton, all your department heads, public works, do we ask them to cut their budget? By how much? 5%. 5% cut across the board. Because we're not spending any more than we're taking in on the general services. So that means when you ask for code enforcers and they're slow to come out, or in your business and you go to DPI and it's slow to come out, it's because we're not increasing the number of employees. We cut. We gave them the increase. Because what we said to Dr. Maxwell is, 
we don't want any of this money to replace. So the increase in the tax that we're talking about, that's on top. That's the amount of money that he's supposed to use to give us line item by line item that takes us from where we are at the bottom to the top. Because if he does that, then I can go out and recruit businesses to come here and, and expand our commercial tax base so we're not a county that has 30% of its money coming from residential house, uh, property taxes, and maybe we can get 70% of that or 50% coming from commercial tax base. We've got to expand it. But yes, so all of the money, 100% of it, $133 million is an addition the only thing we asked of the school system, well, actually, we asked two things. One, that additional money can't go to hiring that Sasser. And if you don't know what Sasser means, that's, his, that's like uh, county administration building for me. It can't go to, uh, to expand his staff. So he can't use this to hire another Christian. Two, all of the money, well, actually, are three things. Two, we said... This money has to go into programs that will take us from the bottom to the top, and you have to delineate it line item by line item. Do I have the budget? Do I have the authority to do a line item budget? No. But he agreed, probably under duress, <laughs> under duress, that he would go line item by line item by line item. And we had Terry and Tom Himmler, who's not here, to go over there and sit with them and say, tell us where every dime is going so that we know in year one you're spending this on this program and we can check and see whether it's working in year two, in year three, in year four so we can measure the progress. All of the additional money goes on top, goes on top of what they were going to get because what we've been giving them, the Baker administration, the Johnson administration, the Curry administration, what we've been giving them is minuscule increases to maintain where we are. So this is to move us, not to maintain us for the next 30 years at 23 or 24 and hope Baltimore City has a bad year. And I would just, just want to uh, add, add again, and I think it has been stated, the, the state with that, uh, allowing us to be able to do what we're planning on doing, it comes with the accountability. We have to submit an annual report that not only speaks to what the collection rate is attached to that increased rate, but also how that money is being spent. And I would anticipate that we're going to have great scrutiny, which is why, again, we have, we've tried to make it as transparent as possible, and, and if passed, this is a, a, um, a line item on your tax bill to make it very easy for us to be able to report to the state. But we realize all eyes will be on us in terms of making sure that this money goes where it's supposed to go. That's a, that's a, good, uh, that's a good point. In addition to the school, the school board, board check, the school board will, will check on them. The council will check on them. We're going to check on them, and the state has the other scrutiny on there. Um, before we get to another question, if you did not do this, I should say this publicly, just a public service announcement. Um, I've been re referring to Doug Brown in the back here. Wave your hand, Doug. I know he's shy. Um, I want to signal Doug out because uh, when we talk about the turnaround in the county over the last four years, uh, it would not have been possible if Doug was not willing uh, to leave his good paying private sector job and to come into the administration and to help us recreate our uh, budget finance and come up with the ideas for economic development and that was a great sacrifice to him and his family um, but he did it and so a lot of the things you see now is because of his work we can give him a round of applause and he's one of your own right here at university park approximately 61 percent of people in Chevrolet make less than seventy thousand dollars we've addressed this but i think it bears repeating about 5% live in poverty. With yet more taxes proposed, what does Mr. Baker propose to do with yet more entering those poverty ranks? We have a couple of questions that have the question right. framed just about like that. Right, so 
So if you're making, we're looking at the amount, so if you make 70 and, and below, you would not be affected by this at all. If you qualify for the homestead tax deduction, you would not qualify for this at all. If you're a senior and you come to us and we know you're on a fixed income, you, you probably, the people in here um, who are fall into that category, won't be affected by the tax rate. I mean, in all honesty, let's be honest. Most people who are affected, who, who fall into the category of that question, won't be affected by this. They really won't. The people who will shoulder the burden are a lot of you in this audience today. Those of us, like myself, who do live in Chevrolet, who make over $70,000. People who live in Mitchellville. People who live in Fort Washington. People who live in Woodmore. There are certain segments of this county where people will pay a lot more because of the value of their home. They're going to shoulder the burden. The flip side of that, though, is if we improve the education system, the value of your home that you own right now goes up. So when I'm in Fort Washington and somebody is telling me, I don't want to pay anymore, I got this really nice home that's right on the water, I say that's great, and I know it's worth a lot of money, but guess what? If you just took your boat right across Virginia, you triple your value. No more crime in your side of Maryland than their side of Virginia. Only thing different is they can send their kids, if they choose, which they don't, to a public school that's one of the best in the country. If you want your values to go up, this is how you do it. Before we go on to the next question, I just want to tell anybody who's uncomfortably warm, we have a, an overflow room um, that's much cooler, and you can see and hear everything that's going on. And there's somebody there to take questions if you have a question. Um, it's being streamed in there. It's being streamed in there. So you could be, it's being videoed in there. Just, if you go over there, just know I look fatter on the screen. I'm not. <laughs> I've actually lost weight. But, it, but it's seriously cooler in there. Um, what assurance can you give that the school system will use this money effectively? Start, and I'll let um, Dr. Maxwell. What, what I can assure you is what we're going to do at the executive level. Um, not only with Betty's uh, shop as the, as the deputy county administrator for education, uh, Tahani is around here somewhere. Um, you know, we got, uh, we got uh, Terry's group at budget and Tom Himmler, and all of us actually will scrutinize, you know, how this money is being used, but more importantly, whether it's making a difference or not. So as county executive, I can tell you, and if you haven't been assured of that over the last four years, how many times I've weighed into education, um, you can rest assured that we're going to pay close attention to how all the dollars are being spent, but more importantly, whether they're making progress. I can also assure you, if we do this, that every council member will make sure. They're vested now. They're in it. They're on the line. So they're going to make sure that Dr. Maxwell, with their own budget uh, oversight committee, is making sure. And as Terry said, the state. The state gave us the authority to do this, but they also added scrutiny. And then you have the school board. It is their responsibility to look at whether in fact these programs are working and making a difference and to make sure that every single school benefits from this and they're using it effectively. And then finally, you the voters. You get the ultimate say. Not for me, I'll be out of here. But everybody else running in the next county executive to say whether in fact this experiment worked. What we do know, like I can't give you a guarantee, you know, Dr. Maxwell can tell you the programs that he thinks will work. All we can use is our best guess. But what I do know, that if we keep putting the amount of money that we've been putting in there, I can guarantee you this, I can guarantee you we'll be 23rd or 24. That I can guarantee you, because everybody else is going to ratchet it up. Dr. Maxwell? So, so I think I can restate some of what I said earlier, which is we spent about a year and a half developing a plan to move this district forward. It's what I came back home for. 
Uh, it's the only reason I came back home. And, and we put together a plan, and it's very, very detailed. And again, it's on our website. I'm not going to go through and read it all, but every dollar uh, that, we're, that we requested over top of last year's budget is in that. You can, you can go look at it. They can go look at it. The state can go look at it. It outlines $20 million for this, $6 million for that. Absolutely every piece of the plan is in there. We'll be able to report out on, you know, how many literacy coaches we've hired and where we've placed them, how many gifted specialists. We've already gone down school by school in the entire district for the first time in history and developed a here's what it means to University Park, for example. And you heard the principal talk about that earlier. We've told them how much additional school-based budgeting uh, money they'd get an estimate of the professional development funds that they will get, um, the, the uh, gifted specialists that you heard her talk about. We've made an estimate because we have some money in there for uh, some, some closing the gap on the salary issues. And so based on their current faculty here, we've made an estimate of this means probably somewhere around this amount of money for University Park. We've done that for all over 200 schools in the district so that, you know, we, we, we can say, you know, unequivocally, here's what University Park gets, here's what, you know, uh, fellow G Elementary School gets, Here, here's what, you know, every, every school in the district gets. And, and I think that in terms of the accountability on the, on the data, we've committed to the board, to the county council, the county executive, that will be very public about the data. And as, when it's the appropriate time each year, and I say that because like this year we couldn't announce graduation rates until the state certified them, certified the rates for across the state, and that took till January. So if I don't have the data until January, that's when I can release it. That's where. But we, what we've said is that for the the academic achievement standard, for example, we'll release that when we have all of the information, and we'll be very public about it. When we have the high-performing workforce, the turnover rates, the additions, all of those things, we'll, when that right time is, whether that's the 1st of November or what, we will, we will release it when it is releasable and then have a final report at the end of the year. Dr. Davis, you looked like you wanted to well, add to that. It's been interesting because I think that a lot of these questions just boil down to trust. You know, can you trust us with not only the funds but also with the results? I think what's different about this particular administration is that finally Prince George's County has chosen an administration that has people that grew up in this county, that graduated from the high schools in this county, and for some of us who have babies in the county. That's the difference. So not only do I put the deputy superintendent hat on when I'm developing the strategic plan and doing my work, but I have my mommy hat on also. I have two children that are in the school system. And when you are invested as a mommy, in addition to a employee, that's the commitment that you have right now. That's the buy-in that you have. I graduated from Bowie High School. I have two children. I have a 10th grader and a fourth grader in this system. Dr. Maxwell graduated from Bladensburg High School, had two children graduate from our county school system. Our chief operating officer graduated from Potomac High School, has two babies in our school system. That's what's different this time. It's not these outsiders coming in saying we want better for Prince George's County. It's people who grew up in this county, that are invested in this county, that are gonna also pay the additional taxes in this county for our babies. That's what's different and we get the whole question about trust. And trust is built over time. Trust is built with relationships. Give us the time. My baby, the youngest one is only 10 years old. I have time, can't retire. Don't plan on going anywhere. Love the school system. Parents still live. They're retired. Their taxes are going up also. So that's what I'm hearing a lot of. It's just about the trust, and trust is going to take time. Yeah, I, absolutely. Thank you. And, and, as it, and as it takes time, our school board commitment was, and we've said this from the very beginning, trust but verify. So that very explicit thing that, that, that Dr. Max was talking about, you will have a public annual progress report. 
that tells the good news, it tells the bad news, it tells the challenges, and it tells what we're going to do. So we're going to be reporting that to you as citizens every single year and even on an ongoing basis. So we, we, we're going to let that trust build over time, and we're going to have high accountability and high transparency. And can I do this for a second here? This is what we do, everyone. We're going to read the questions. I promise you, I will stay here as long as until the cleaning staff kicks me out. I will ask, answer any question you have once we go through the questions on there. I promise you that. I won't go anywhere. I will stay here. So if you have the question, you want to go, you want to, you know, come up and we can go back and forth. That's great because we want that. This is your time. But as soon as we go through the question, because that's fair to everybody who wrote their question. So I will stay here, okay? I ain't going nowhere. I'll be right here. Right here. Why not focus on making parents accountable for ensuring their kids do well in school? That's free, and it will make Prince George's County schools in the top ten. There you go. Dr. Dr. Maxwell, I think that's a UN Segun question. <laughs> parents. So, um, so parents are, are very important. There's no, no question about that. Um, in terms of accountability, it's a public school system, and we take the people who live in our district. We are, however, working. Uh, we, we opened a department of uh, parent and community outreach last year to provide a, a parent training and support resource. We have um, added parent advocates in schools uh, that we've been expanding uh, last year and this year in order to provide resources for parents and, and people who can reach out from the school to parents. So it's not always a one-way uh, piece. The board has instituted a parent advisory group. And so we, we understand that parents are important and we felt like that, that uh, parent and community outreach part of the organization was missing when we got here. And so again, we, we have tried to institute this. We pulled some people from our Comer office uh, to help, you know, begin a training program for a lot of our parents. We have a lot of parents who don't understand how to help their children in school and how to make that connection. And that's also part of the planning that we're doing with the implementation of the strategic plan is how do we help parents understand what they need to be able to do to help their children in school. Dr. Davis, I'm not sure if you were looking to answer that or will. So, oh, I'm trying to find out. I don't know where I am these days. I was trying to find out what elementary school I was in this morning. I think it's Oakland. Oakland. So as I'm finishing my typical school visit, um, the principal there introduced me to a parent resource person, um, young, young Latina, that, hey, we got right there, just like that one. And you know how she got that person? I don't know how they got them here, but in Oakland, um, she used the money that Dr. Maxwell gave her to hire someone to make sure to help her with community outreach, especially those who don't know how to advocate or access the system, but more importantly for parental engagement. It's great, we need more of it. But in order to do that, that's why as part of the budget that we gave him was a line item that said, we need more of this because we're gonna have parents, grandparents, sisters, brothers, who are taking care, who we need to engage in a system. But also what would be helpful is if we built a great school system where, as my wife liked to say, she wanted her kids not only to be racially diverse in their neighborhoods, but she wanted them economically diverse. Because she knew that us being, us being active in a school system would help the next child next to our child. So we need to make sure we have a school system where people are putting their kids back into the school system because they trust, one, their child will be safe, two, they'll get academic rigor. And so part of what we want to do is for those parents who don't know how to advocate for themselves in an effective way, not complain, but effectively advocate for their child in the school system, we want to make sure that happens. That's why the resources are there. It's not going to happen by osmosis. It just really isn't. That's just life. I wish it wasn't, but it isn't. And so we have to be engaged in that. And I saw it today, and it was terrific. 
So this is a related question. Um, how will the increase in taxes increase parent and other volunteer programs? I think I just said that. I mean, the increase, where there's a line item. How much do we put toward uh, parental and community engagement? Terry, you know offhand? Two million and 20, 20 new advocates. How many? 20 new advocates, $2 million. Can you tell us exactly how you planned to allocate the $133 million in new funds and how much is budgeted for each new program investment in your strategic plan? So that's all on the website. I think the, the cleanest look at that is the PowerPoint from the budget that's dated, I think, February 23. Yeah, she's going to pull up the one page we'll, so we can make sure we do the highlights with the numbers. We might skip to the next question. We'll come back to that because we'll pull it up. Okay. So, so again, the 100, and, I, and I've said this a few times, the $133 million increase is delineate, they're asking how, 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 what we're spending it all on, and I'm, and I'm, I'm just explaining that it's on the February 23 PowerPoint yeah. slide that we presented to the board and then, and then sure. presented to the county council. Yeah, if you just go to pgcps.org backslash promise, every particular piece is there, but if there's a particular question, I'll send on the And the February here. 23 PowerPoint presentation is also on the website. Yep. It has every one of the categories yep. spelled out. So it would have the 20 new parent advocates for $2 million, the money set aside for salary increases, the number of mentor teachers, the peer assistance and review program, all of those, all of those pieces. The next question is, uh, why keep a large, dysfunctional, underachieving school system when our large county could be divided into many school districts that would be easier to manage? Well, that's not a decision that we get to make at the local level. Um, so we have to go with the school system the state has, has given us. That's not, that's above my pay grade and Dr. Maxwell's. Although, although in the supervision of, of schools and the supervision of the organization, we do have uh, associate superintendents overseeing three separate offices and each have instructional directors that are the direct supervisor of the schools. And so we do have a structure that, that isn't like all 200 some schools coming across Dr. Davis's desk or my desk. We have a, 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 a structure in the organization that helps us with that supervisory work. It's worth, it's worth noting that the educational research, a lot of other states who's, who create all these small systems, solidifies levels of educational inequity and creates pockets of brilliance, just like you have here in Prince George's County, but also solidifies and makes more permanent the pockets of inequity and the pockets of low performance. Um, so there's not much data or evidence to show that breaking us up into smaller pieces would help every student at every school. It might help some kids, but it's not going to help all kids. So this is a combination of a statement and a question. What do I tell my neighbors when they complain about the increase in property tax? Education and our schools are so important to our town and families. What about the great need to increase funding for early childhood education? And what are your thoughts on bilingual education, especially at the elementary level? Exact, that's exactly what we asked Dr. Maxwell to do. So we're increasing early uh, K through 12 education. And one of the, th the things I asked him to do when he came in was, you know, bilingual education. You know, Spanish immersion, other programs. We have Chinese or Mandarin, I should say, in, in Laurel. But to expand those programs, he's already begun that. We're seeing that. Uh, Phyllis E. Williams has a program, um, I believe, uh, Mount Over Overlook, places we wouldn't even, Cesar Chavez, but places we wouldn't have looked at before. We've done that. But in order to continue that so that our children actually come out speaking another language, you've got to be able to carry that through the middle school and the high school. And more importantly, we need to be able to do it in every part of this county. This is a huge county. So the amount seems large, but we want to make sure there's equity and fairness throughout. Because when we actually give him a lower amount, that money is used for the pressing needs. And it doesn't help us expand programs throughout. 
So here's an interesting question. Will this really pass? What can we do to make sure it does? Call your council. question. Please call, write, email your council members. Over and over. But call them. Please call, email, write your council members um, and say, listen, you know, take this chance with us. You know, I believe we have the right leader at the school system. I believe we have the right support from our delegation to the state. I believe and I commit this county administration to helping you. But if we don't invest in ourselves, we're not going to get the resources. No one else is going to invest in it. They just aren't. They aren't going to give me the money. I asked them. I said, please, could you just send me some of your extra dollars? They said, no, we're going to use it for our kids. I mean, call the council members and tell them, we need this. We can put the accountability in there. We can put a sunset provision if that's what gets them across the hurdle so that when MGM and the rest of these projects come online and we have the resources to replace it, but we need it now or else we're going to fall further and further behind so that when another administration 20 years from now comes in with a county executive crazy enough, they don't like me to say that because they tape it, um, to do this, they'll have to propose an even larger one. But we need your help on this one. How do you know that salary is the reason that the public school system cannot have and keep good teachers? So salary is part of it. The other part is uh, support. And I think the third part uh, are the rest of the working conditions, like class sizes, for example. So, so as I visited all of the schools last year, just a, an example or so, I, I, I walked into high school advanced placement classes in English, for example, and found classes in the low to mid 40s and teachers sometimes teaching multiple classes. That's a tremendous load. So on an eight period day, essentially, you know, an A day, B day, four periods a day, teachers are teaching about six classes a day. I mean, uh, every other, you know, two carrying six all together. And so if two of those are AP, that's 84 or 85 kids just in those two classes. How do you really expect a teacher to be able to give the individual kind of attention, the in-depth kind of assignments, the writing assignments that kids have to do, when you're giving them workload issues like that. It, it just, I mean, that's one of the issues. The support for teachers, particularly new teachers and teachers who are struggling, the state, when they increase the time for tenure, they put out a ratio for the number of mentor teachers that we should have uh, for our teachers. And we're so far away from that, it's unbelievable. I mean, we just don't have the support for our teachers. And so we have, uh, you know, we've had this need to triage. So, you know, okay, you're doing good after six months. Well, we're going to turn our attention to somebody else, and now you're going to sink or swim for that for that next year and a half, except for at the evaluation time. It just doesn't work. And so, so we're trying to increase mentor teachers. We've entered into an agreement with our teachers association in a collaborative partnership called Peer Assistance and Review, where we have people sitting at the table. The teachers association has people sitting at the table. The primary goal is to help teachers be successful. But at the end of the day, if that doesn't work, Right? There's a process in place for making sure that we move on. And we hopefully mutually agree we're going to move on, but, but we move on because that accountability has to be there. And then the third piece is salary. We have got to be competitive with our largest, uh, you know, the largest districts nearby. And it is, is worth noting, I know you said that, you usually say this, so I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to say it, because we know there's a whole lot of factors, but we do have hard data on salary. When you enter as a teacher in Prince George's County, you make just a little less than your surrounding counties. The longer you stay in Prince George's County, the wider that gap becomes. By the time you get to six, seven years in, your teachers in your surrounding counties with the same amount of education and experience are making ten to $15,000 more. A teacher who teaches throughout their career in Prince George's County will make $200,000 less throughout their career than a teacher in the surrounding county. So we have the, that hard core data that's pretty hard to ignore. Thank you. With the new residential development at Woodmore, won't new residents offset the need to increase property taxes as well as other residential development in areas such as National Harbor, Indian Head, and Waldorf, which 
which isn't in Prince George's County. Not in Prince George's County. <laughs> but if you know a way I can get their tax, I was going to say, if you know a way I can get their taxes, I'll take that. Um, you know, and Doug and, and anybody, Terry will tell you, residential property taxes never pay for themselves. Whether you have children or no children, is not just the school system, it's public safety, it's public works, it is never. You know, you actually are going to spend more. I don't care what, you know, we tried that. That was the 80s model. If we build all these mansions, that will, that will, that's the promise. That was the key. That was the rainbow. Just build mansions. Everybody will move in. We'll have a tax base. Guess what? We built mansions. People moved in. It didn't pay for itself because you still have to get the services. We still have to provide the schools just in case somebody decides with a downturn in the, in the economic market, guess what? They go into private and public schools. So we got to prepare for all of it. Or snow comes and we got to plow where they are. It's a big county, 500 square miles. So no, it, it will never pay for itself. Now what would help us is if we can expand our commercial tax base. If we could balance it out so that we're not getting 70% for residential property taxes and 30% for commercial, if we could get that to a, to a happy medium. But I can't get there without it's chicken and egg. I can't get there without the school system. The school system was better. I could attract more, right, David Iannucci? We could go to Vegas next week. We could all tell them what a great school system that we have. Guess what? If I had a number one school system throughout Prince George's County, I'd have the FBI here today. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind. The only thing Fairfax can say is, hey, you're bringing FBI agents and workers from around the nation to this consolidated headquarters we got a great school system. They're going to want to live here. That's the only thing we're missing. So, you, no, it doesn't pay for itself. I need the commercial tax base. We have 19 more questions to go. And Mr. Baker has said we're going to stay here and answer every one of them. So here's the next one. And it's 8 o'clock. I'm bringing, just bringing that to your attention and let you know that we'll be here until every one of these is answered. Why are four administrator-level positions at $1 million a piece being added for PR when teachers will not even get a raise? Want me to repeat it? Why are four administrator level positions at $1 million a piece being added for PR when teachers will not even get a raise? I'm going to sign up for that one. So. So, so let me first say I don't have any million dollar positions in, in the budget in communication or anywhere else. And, and we did add a, a chief communications officer this year uh, to oversee all of the internal and external communication that we do. It's a function that this organization was terribly uh, missing. A public information officer is, you know, not adequate to really develop a strategy and really help us, again, with that internal and external communication. Can I just answer this? Because here, here's what I, because the earlier question I think got to it. What we said was the budget that Dr. Maxwell has now is his budget. By law, I can't reduce that. So the salaries and people he's hired, by law, it's his budget. Maintenance of effort, I can't reduce it. What we can have an impact on is future dollars that we give them, which is why it was very important to us that he tell us where every last dime of this new resources goes so that we looked at Because we asked him the question about salaries. We asked him the question about staffing. Uh, we asked him the question about bringing on, that this money cannot be used for that. It can be used in terms of salary for teachers' pay raise so that we actually keep those teachers, but not hiring new staff people. And, and I think it's also important, again, I'm not sure that teacher part, but, but Mr. Haynes, didn't we negotiate a multi-year agreement with the Teachers Association last year? And did that include salary improvements for several years in a row, for two years in a row? This, this is kind of a process question. Um, why are you not debating residents? I'll be happy to debate anybody as soon as we finish reading the question. It's just fair to the people who wrote the question. But whoever wrote that, if you want to stay around, I will be here until 
our beautiful maintenance people kick me out. And then we can go outside and finish it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I phrased that wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't really mean we I didn't mean it that way. It's been filmed. I didn't mean it that way. Jerome edited that out. But, I, but I'll stay a while, and we, can, we can, uh, and we can go back and forth if you want. I will be here. So here's another uh, a good question. The zero tolerance policy, as many studies have shown, is little more than a pipeline to prison. Yet Prince George's County Public Schools, even though they have repudiated such policies officially, often have very punitive systems. What can you do to make Prince George's County Public Schools focus more on enlightenment and ideas of personal growth and less on harsh punishment? So I think that's a great you know, question. And you know, Maryland overall made some policy changes at the state uh, MSDE level uh, to that very issue. And so everybody in the state is working to realign uh, their uh, policies and procedures as it relates to uh, student code of conduct. We're also working with the Teachers Association to. We're also working with the Teachers Association uh, on a restorative uh, justice conversation about how how we can work that way. And, and so, I, you know, I acknowledge that we have work to do in that area. We want safe and orderly schools, but we also have to do it with the understanding that our role is really to nour nourish and encourage and nurture uh, the children under our charge. There are some kids that are you know, way far out of bounds and there's some very firm things that need to be in place there, but there's a lot of, of developmental work that needs to happen uh, with, our, with our children. We have reduced arrests uh, in our schools. We are monitoring the number of suspensions and expulsions that we have and we're working very hard to make sure uh, that we are uh, appropriate, I guess, in our in our methods of dealing with kids. Arrest, arrests are down, suspensions are down, and the idea of keeping students in classes, finding alternative suspensions. I mean, a, a lot of us on the board are very big on this issue that, you know, you can't graduate students when you suspend them for five days and they're not learning. We know we got to keep them learning, we got to keep them engaged, uh, and, and I think uh, and. Dele uh, Delegate Valentino Smith, who's do been doing a lot of work with us around reducing, uh, uh, going to, and, and, and Delegate Washington as well, right? Because if, if, he just introduced a piece of legislation around the same thing uh, uh, this term. So you got a lot of folks who are really working on this issue about how you keep these young students engaged and involved in their education. We know that they, we, we can't have them be disruptive, all kids have to learn, but if we remove them and, and take them out and they don't graduate, then we're creating a, a, a cycle that is completely inappropriate. So we're working really hard on that. Before, before you read the next question, David, I need you to come up here, because something was pointed out to me, thank you, Senator Pinsky. I, I said Vegas, and I think most of you are thinking, oh boy, he's going to gamble. Um, Vegas is where, where, David? International Conference for Shopping Centers. International Com uh, Conference for Shopping Centers. That's where we go out and actually try and get businesses to come to the county, and we do our pitch. We sit in rooms, and they come to us. Now they come to us, but when we first went out there, we went around to each and every shopping center and business to try to convince them to come to Prince George's County. And I got a lot of doors slammed in my face, didn't I, David? Right. First year was tough. Uh, but now they're actually coming to us. So when I say going to Vegas and convincing people, that's actually where we're doing. So thank you. <laughs> you, you got that on film? Can administrator salaries, school system, county executive, et cetera, be cut or made reasonable rather than burden singles or fire income or seniors? I'm going to go first because mine is shorter. Um, by law, I cannot cut the county executive salary because I'm just temporary. Um, the next person would not like it very much if I cut the salary and I don't have the, the right to. What I can do and what I'm going to do is that we're going to do five days of furlough. I'm signing up for the five days. Because everybody else, every, I think you have to is shared sacrifice. So those five days that I'm offering the, the, you know, sent down to the council, because we can't spend more money than we have in. 
So in my case, one, I can't, and I've asked this, um, I cannot cut the county executive salary, um, but what I can do is sign up for the five-day furloughs, and uh, I will do that. So, um, so many of our administrators in the school system are also covered by bargaining uh, agreements. You can't just unilaterally cut people's salaries. So you, you negotiate, again, the vast majority of the systems in our school district are covered by even the administrators. And I'd also say that that same disparity exists with principals and assistant principals, for example, where you, you know, there are neighboring jurisdictions where you can make you know, $10,000, $15,000 a year more uh, for principalships and assistant principalships than, than here. And so you know, you have to, you know, you're going to get what you pay for one way or the other, and you need strong leadership as well. You need people who are committed to the work, who have uh, the knowledge and skills that you need, and you need to pay them for that. That's, that's the idea of running large organizations. You want to add to that? I, yeah, I think the next set of questions, so trust is what I heard from the first um, group of questions. I think the next set of questions that I've heard are attempts of how we can possibly cut um, expenses within the school system in order not to have to raise taxes. And I think we have to look at it from a different perspective. So I'm not sure how many of you all during the spring, you know, put all of the winter clothes away and brought out all of your spring clothes um, and packed up. So what I didn't do during that time is that I did not do a good job of packing this belt with the dress. So for the past month and a half, I've been looking for the belt to this dress. And I went through my closet. I'm, I'm a little challenged with my height. I kept going through my closet. I'm like, I know this belt is in the closet. Finally, last night, I brought in a chair. I stood on top of the chair, and there was the belt. Different perspective. I couldn't see it from my perspective. But when I stood on the chair, I could fi finally see my belt. What's interesting is that we are a generous county and a generous country. Whenever there's a crisis, whether it's within the United States or overseas, we give willingly. We don't ask, can that country save a little bit of money? How did they waste their resources? We just give when there's a crisis. We have to take a look at Prince George's County school system right now as a crisis. Our children are not graduating. That's unfair. As I was flipping through my phone, the US News and World Report came out today. Maryland, once again, is topping the country with the best high schools. Guess who had seven high schools in Maryland on this list? Who? Montgomery County. We had two. Montgomery County just has one more high school than we do, comprehensive high school. We have 28, they have 29 but yet they have seven high schools on this prestigious national list. Guess what high schools were on our list? The first one was what? Roosevelt. Oh, why can everybody just resoundingly say that? You're right, number 24. And the other school was Oxon Hill High School at 54, 56. However, Thank you for that clap. <laughs> However, why is it that you either have to live in a certain zip code to get the best high school education, or you have to get into those two magnet programs? That's not fair. We are in a crisis in Prince George's County when it comes to public education. Think about it from a different perspective, not the perspective that all of us are looking for that is going to affect our pocket. We get that. That's the perspective that many of us are looking, that this tax increase is going to affect our pocket. But can we look at it from the perspective of the future? And the future is our children. And can we give willingly to those that don't have a voice in here, those that don't have a vote? That's the perspective that we need to look at this 15 cent increase and this $133 million more that we're asking to give 
for the children of Prince George's County. Oh, real fast, we also cut from our own, and I think the county budget may have a better answer on the number, but it was around $70 million, I think, that we identified in reductions in our own budget in, in places where we thought we could live without that and move forward in this other area. So it in, does already include some reductions within the school system. Is the tax increase a one-time event or a permanent increase? It is both one-time and permanent until we reduce it. So the amount of money that um, we send over to the school system, once we send it there, that becomes the baseline of their budget. The only way we can reduce, and it doesn't have to come from property taxes, it can come from other methods, but once the only way to reduce the amount of money that we give to the school system after that is to replace that money by something else. Either replace it by the money we're bringing in from economic development or replace it by our assessments going up, but it has to be replaced. We, we cannot um, go into the school system and say, hey, we want to take that money back. So you can reduce your property. In, in fact, they're doing it in Anne Arundel County, and I used this before. The county executive there said in a debate, you know, we were actually debating, but he threw out that I was raising taxes, and he's cutting, and he's right. He's giving property owners in Anne Arundel County a tax cut. But what he's not doing is taking the money out of his school system. They're still getting 66% or thereabout of their local money is going to education. But because he's getting money from live, the casino, and because their school system has gone up and they're actually getting more businesses there, he actually has shown can do a saving. Now, I don't know if he can sustain that, but he's doing a cut. It's a small one, but he's doing a cut. We could do the same. If we start, revenue start going up, then school system has to get its baseline, but we can then cut. My daughter is a kindergartner at Cesar Chavez Elementary School, which we love. Will the new budget allow a longer school day? I think ours is shorter than most other jurisdictions. She is rushed from one subject to the next. So the minimum, the minimum is mandated by state law, and I know we meet the minimum, but I can't tell you what the hours are uh, for every one of the 24 you know, jurisdictions. But, but the, the crux of the question is, no, it doesn't include an extension of the school day. Have any other alternatives been, been considered besides the drastic proposals of a tax hike, layoffs, <laughs> and furloughs in this budget proposal? Yes. We believe me, we have spent countless hours trying to figure this out, right, Terry? Um, each year I've been county executive. The first year I came in, it was a $75 million budget deficit. The second year was a $110 million budget deficit. Third year was a, how much? Keeps growing 115, 120. This year is how much? About 130. Each year there's been a budget deficit. What we've done in the past is we've gone to our one-time money, which is the rainy day money. So it's been raining for five years. We've gone there and we've done it, and, 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 and Eric Olson can tell you this. What we've done in the past is we tried to shave off doing the furloughs and layoffs. We've gone into that one-time money and it saved us from doing it that year. Um, unfortunately, what happens is it makes Wall Street really shaky when you come there, like last year, and they say, well, why are you spending so much money from your reserves on, on salaries? Or why do you have so much overtime in your police department? Can't you reduce that? And we said, well, we need the officers. So we looked at if there is any other option. Believe me, there is nothing left. There's no place else to squeeze. We've cut departments so bare that I have directors now who want to quit. They're like, we can't take it. We're asking them to do more with less. I don't want to let 110 people go. I need my job, and I know they need theirs. But I have two choices. Either I find revenue, which I don't have. I can't cut the school system. 
Because even if this doesn't pass, that won't help me on this side. Still got the 110 people that got to go. Because I've got to fix, as the council has told me, the structural deficit, which will take us a while. Well, in order to fix that structural deficit, we have to start reducing our people. So people who've had departments, whether it's the health department, you know, infectious diseases is one area where we wanted to see people grow. I think I saw some questions from council members, like why don't you have enough nurses? Guess what, we can't hire them. We close those out. So we're cutting every single where. There's no other option. On that side of the ledger, there's nothing. It's bone bare. You know, the council is gonna have to figure out where they're gonna get it from, because we don't have it. There's no. On this side, we have one option or two options. The state has given us the authority for property taxes to go up. We're hitting businesses, so we're gonna make everybody mad. Businesses, property taxes, telephone, communication taxes, apartment owners that we came up and said, well, you know, what about the apartment owners? Guess what, they in it too. But all that goes to education. So after it's all said and done, if we pass this and improve our education, I still will have a police department, corrections, sheriffs, uh, fire department, and a lot of government employee workers who are mad because, you know, when they come up and testify, they say, why can't you take some of their money and help us out? I can't. It's illegal. I can only help them. On the other end, if we don't grow the tax base, grow assessment, we're going to continue to cut because the one thing I won't do is after I leave this office is I won't hand the keys over to the next person and say, guess what? We got a surprise for you. It's called a huge deficit that you got to figure out on day one. If this tax is imposed, will we be informed how it is applied and the levels of success achieved, which I think we've responded to. Right, I'll do it real quick and then I'll let Doc. Uh, the way that we'll inform you is it will be on your tax bill. So that amount will definitely be on your bill for them to see, right? Okay. I, and I do think we've answered the other question you, you, about, you have. about and how it's being spent and how we'll know. And there'll be an annual progress report. That's correct. As well. Um, Prince George's County has the lowest per capita income in the region. How does that impact commercial development? Um, I'm not sure it, it, it has as big of an impact. What we found is, is the, our income levels are actually pretty good. You know, we're, we're pretty much around, you know, the, the national average, we're just above. So the income levels are pretty good. What impacts us on commercial development, just to be honest, is our education system. Because that determines the value of your county, like I said, unless you're a city. So when we go to compete with Fairfax County or Arlington County, um, Montgomery County, Howard County, we're competing with them out here for jobs. They look better because people say, well, they have a great reputation. And that reputation is based on their, on, on their school systems. That has a greater impact on our economic development than anything. Are any changes anticipated or planned in teacher evaluation and in the procedures for reducing the number of underperforming teachers and other staff members? So the teacher evaluations were redone across the state of Maryland. Every district had to have their evaluation uh, their evaluations uh, approved by MSD by the state and and so that's been done so there's no new ones I mean we have an approved new uh, program and we're, yeah, we're on our second year and I mentioned earlier uh, about the peer assistance and review program and working with our teachers association to try to, try to support teachers who who are struggling or underperforming and then if they are uh, not up to, to speed there talking about what else may need to happen, but we are uh, holding uh, folks accountable and we are engaged in the work of, of making sure that we give our teachers all the support we can. It's worth, it's worth noting for those who don't know, this peer assistance and review model 
is really a nationally recognized model where we're on the cutting edge of working together with labor management in ways that really will improve the quality of education in our classrooms and help, help new teachers who are struggling. Uh, and if those teachers are struggling and they're not cutting it, then, then, then the union and, and management are working together to say we're not going to tolerate having people who can't improve and do what's right by kids in our classrooms. And so it's a tremendously powerful program uh, that, that is really improving the quality of education and the quality of teaching in Prince George's County. Eddie, if I could just add one thing on that last question I left out. Um, we're trying, we're working on a national philanthropic uh, company to come and invest in Prince George's County. During the discussion uh, with this national organization that invests you know, millions of dollars into the county, we're trying to convince them to go into the Suitland area and Bladensburg area. The whole debate was about this proposal. And they were actually taking bets as to what are the chances of it passing. And the reason they were actually taking the bet about whether they would invest is to determine how serious we are about education. And so anytime we're dealing with companies, and, and we were late for the meeting because we were talking to another company, we're trying to get come to Prince George's County, and we're talking about all these great things and location and what we're doing. And then the question was, well, are you going to get your tax proposal through? I said, well, you know, we're doing everything we can. And it's just an odd question from an engineering firm or company to ask. But it really goes to the heart of the matter is everything revolves around if you're going to invest, and they're out of town, if you're going to invest into a place, you want to know they're going to be around for a while and that's the best determination of whether you invest and bring people here. Dr. Maxwell says we must, that he must recruit and compete with other states and counties for teachers. We have a lot of employees uh, making excellent salaries who live in other counties in million dollar townhomes. How do we get residents of Prince George's County to become police officers firefighters, and teachers that actually live in the county? The firefighters and police, improve your schools. Talk to any of the police officers, firefighters who move out of the county. First thing they'll say is when they have school-aged children, not everywhere, if they get in the select schools that, um, you know, uh, Dr. Davis talked about, then they'll consider it. If they don't, then they move. And it's all based on one thing. It's not houses, it's based on education. It is based on houses because they want to make sure the value goes up when they move out. But that's, you want to get them here? That's what you do, improve the schools. And, and I agree with that. And I would also just add we have programs like the Fire Cadet Academy, which is in collaboration with the fire department and our uh, schools, which you know, give them the, the training from the fire department personnel. It's, it's a little bit like, you know, some of the traditional T &I, uh, technical and industrial education programs. But we have one of those programs in the county. We're having some discussions about replication. But we're actually training them to be prepared for the job and to get the licenses. Again, it's back to part of that, you know, measuring things with technical licenses as well. But right now, we have over three quarters of our employees that do live in our county. So, I mean, Principal Davis indicated that she lives in our county. She has two um, children. Okay. The principal of Heather Hills was here. Miss Nima, um, also, once again, a resident of our county. So three quarters, when we're talking over um, a staff of 10,000 employees, three quarters of our workforce does live in our county. And many also have children in our county. And what's been interesting is that even someone who was new to our county came from an, another county. She and her family now have since moved to our county because she works here, she believes in um, Dr. Maxwell and his vision, and even will be sending her kindergartner to our public school system. Great. That's great. Uh, there is, thank you, there's growing emphasis in other school systems to broaden the number of students taking AP courses. What is the school system doing to increase the number of students taking challenging AP courses? Can the school system consider paying the AP test fees for farm students so they can afford to take these tests which are fairly expensive. 
So we, we pay for the AP exams for everybody that takes some farms or otherwise. Three quarters of our students are, uh, about three quarters of our students are free and reduced meal students. So we pay the AP exams, we pay the SAT exams. We've been working to increase the numbers of students who are in advanced placement courses. And I think if you look at the data over the last decade, you'll see that there's been some improvement in those numbers. Uh, I know particular schools, there's been a significant amount of, of increase. What are we, so, so I think that in the longer term, you know, when I mentioned the gifted specialists coming out in elementary schools and the literacy, you know, folks in the secondary schools, and eventually they'll be everywhere, both, both of them, we believe very strongly that we have more kids, but they need to be nurtured. We need to start in the elementary uh, schools with those kids and make sure that they're being exposed uh, to more rigorous work to prepare them for that work they're going to get in secondary schools. Is this just the school district initiative or the point on a total county government coordinated effort with social services, housing, health, et cetera, to support the students and their families? Eddie, you could answer that question, could you? I yes, it is a, a total, total coordinated. It's a total coordinated effort. Everybody in the Prince George's County government is dedicated to our school system. They're all part of it. Right, Ms. Glenda? Yes, they're all part of it. So yes, it is a coordinated effort. What improvement in the school system, Dr. Maxwell, are you most proud of that has taken place during the past two years, in addition to adding Oxon Hill to the U.S. News and World Report? So, so I mentioned a couple of them, but I, I you know, again, I'm, I'm very proud of the graduation rate. I mean, I, again, we came in, you know, almost immediately looking at data and said, we've got we've to do this. And so the graduation rate going up overall 2.47% in a single year. It's the largest since they started using the cohort um, model for graduation in the state of Maryland that we've ever had. It's the highest increase of any district in the state of Maryland last year. The ninth grade promotion rate, which again is very closely tied to that, is really, really important. We had an increase in second grade reading scores uh, last year. But also after, you know, when I, when I got back here last year, we had nine straight years of declining enrollment in the Prince George's County Public School System. And in the last 18 or 20 months or so, uh, we've had an increase of 3,600 students uh, into our district. And so i um, pleased to see us growing as a school district, and I think I, Dr. I Davis. I think that you should also, you're being modest, I think you should also just be proud of attracting people back, employees back to Prince George's County. So when I think about the principal of Glendale Elementary School, he started his career in Prince George's County and then went to a different jurisdiction. Because Dr. Maxwell was here, he believed in Dr. Maxwell, he came back. I can say that also about the principal of Frederick Douglass, and the list goes on. So the number of great employees that unfortunately chose to go to surrounding districts that now are coming back because they believe in our CEO, they believe in Dr. Maxwell, that's what I think you should be most proud of. What is, the, this is a, kind of a related question about graduation. Great. What strategies are you using um, to stop dropouts? Uh, I, it's the other side of the same coin. I mean, you know, you, kids drop out because they're not being successful. They don't see a, a way forward. And so, again, working with the literacy, working with, um, you know, the, the uh, early warning system in ninth grade, trying to make sure that we get kids through the ninth grade, not being overly dependent on suspensions and making sure that we have alternatives uh, for, for kids. And, and again, the kind of the orientation that whether we're responsible for them being out of school or they're responsible for being out of school is still missed instructional time. So, so I think that, uh, you know, they're, they're all related uh, together. I mean, you, your dropouts are a part of, they're the flip side of that graduation rate. It's not a one for one because some kids move away or or whatever, so there, everybody that doesn't graduate isn't necessarily a dropout, but the two things are very closely related. This is kind of related to another question, but not exactly. Um, will all the new higher salary teachers and other workers be required to live in Prince George's County? No. The goal of college and career readiness is important and providing opportunities for all students to succeed is imperative. 
but how will these increased funds help already high achieving students who still need more from our school system? So, so I think, again, we, I've talked about the gifted specialists. We're going to begin rolling them out in elementary school because we believe we have a lot more kids that can be doing higher level work. Uh, they will eventually move into the secondary schools as well, just like we'll begin with literacy specialists in the high schools and, and middle schools and roll those back into elementary schools. They're just going to go backwards at each other. But I agree 100 percent. I mean, my, you know, in my whole career, I've been able to, you know, demonstrate that you have kids that are capable of that work and for whatever reason, we've been holding them back or holding them out. And we need to take those gatekeeper things out of the way and make sure that we're giving kids access. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the important part of it being 15 cents because we didn't want the increases like in the past that have just gone to our challenging schools. This allows us to actually put programs in uh, for our wide range of students throughout the 500 square miles because uh, all of our children are different, but we want to make sure that's why the amount, so when you hear people saying, well, why don't we cut it in half? Well, really what you're doing is you're saying, we're going to go back to the model we've been using for 30 years, and that is we spend it on our most challenging areas, and we just give whatever's left over to those areas where we need to in, in, raise it. Does this increase address the crumbling infrastructure and failing systems at county schools? Well, it doesn't get, and Dr. Maxwell can add to it, it does not go to building new buildings. Um, we have maintained, and we'll do again at the, at the state level, that we're ready to put resources into capital, building a new building. You know, that's not ongoing cost. That's, you know, the building of it. Some of the money can be used for maintenance, I believe Dr. Maxwell will say. But in building a new building, no. We at the county level are ready to build the schools we need. But that's a partnership with the state. And we should not let the state out of that one. That if we were willing to put a lot of resources in building uh, a program in Baltimore City, which I don't begrudge them, I supported it, we should do the same in Prince George's County, Montgomery County, and Baltimore City. I mean, Baltimore County. Because we're, we have some of the oldest schools that are 40 and 50 years old in this county. The one I was in today was 50 years old, as she reminded me, every time we turned a corner. You notice it's 50 years old. It, and we've got our enrollment going up. In Montgomery County, their enrollment is shot through the roof, and they need more money to build new schools. Same thing with Baltimore County. So our commitment from the county executive's office is that we're going to go down there and, and work hard to get the money to build those. But this money goes directly into classrooms to impact the education of our children so we can see their test scores and achievement and graduations go up. So, so, um, so that's the capital side, and we have a billions of dollar deficit in school construction and renovation needs, and, but that's a different pot of money and not part of this. What this does cover is an increase in maintenance for schools. Right now, we only run one shift of maintenance, and that's during the day. And so, you know, it's hard when you have a classroom running, you know, down the hallway to send in an electrician or a plumber or an HVAC mechanic. So what this does is adds a second shift in each of the eight shops over at, uh, in our facilities so that we'll have, after the buses leave with the kids in the afternoon, we'll have plumbers that can come in and electricians that can come in uh, and, you know, HVAC folks that can work on the, the, uh, the cooling, which seems to now be working. Um, maybe maybe we had somebody come out. I don't know, but uh, but but it does help with the maintenance because again we are we're you know anybody that's in and out of schools a lot knows that we're struggling to keep up with the maintenance and so it it gives us a second shift in each one of the departments. How how can we be assured that state funding won't decrease as our county funds allocated to education increase? Well, what I. Well, I can assure you, based on the past performance of this year, is state fund is going to decrease whether we do anything or not. Because the person at the governor's level said he's not raising taxes. I was at the state, and Tawana's gone, but I was served on appropriation. There's not much fat up there either. So he's cutting. When he cuts, he's not cutting the requirements to educate our children. He's passing along to us. So we will get decreases from the state. The question is, what do we do about it at this level? Um, 
you know. So yeah, they're going to decrease our salary. I mean, decrease the amount of money they're giving to us. Have you identified, Dr. Maxwell, any current programs in the school system which are not performing and may be cut in deference to your new programs? Before he answers, Betty, can you tell people how many more questions are there so they'll know? About five more. Okay. After the 19, we got another whole slug of questions, so that's what happened. So, so if I remember, remember the question, it's about uh, cutting the are, cutting are, programs. Are any programs so, going to be cut? So I would say that, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that we've already realigned within our budget or reduced by $70 million. I don't know whether you'd call all of those things programs or not programs, but we've already reduced our budget by $70 million. Uh, I'd say most of the other changes we've made have been realignments. So HR, for example, you know, it was pretty public last year. It was in the news. I didn't feel like we were getting the results out of our human resources department that we should. I was tired of going to public meetings where people constantly came up and said, I applied for your job, for a job in your system and I never got a call back or they lost my paperwork or I interviewed for a, for a position and I never got any information about how I did or whether I was under consideration or not, so I moved on. So, so we um, had everybody reapply for jobs there. We reorganized the department. We, we turned over a bunch of personnel. And, and I'm not hearing those when I go to meetings anymore. When I go out in the public, I'm not saying there aren't still a few issues, but it's certainly not at the, the level that it was. We've established metrics through an outside uh, firm to work with us to make sure that we're you know, meeting the targets that we've set for processing, hiring, and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, so we, we've been working, again, to become a more efficient organization. We have a curriculum audit that's underway right now. Um, you know, again, having outside people come in and say, are we really covering the things in our, you know, big curriculum that we're supposed to be covering so students can achieve? If, if these proposed tax hikes come to fruition, will you do a dog and pony show in the coming years to reveal successes and failures of the education plan? Look, I'm, I, I, uh, yes. Know, yeah, so the, the board was real clear on that. We're dogs and ponies and elephants and <laughs> you name it, we are going to come. And, and you act on both, both our successes and our challenges, absolutely. Uh, what early intervention programs or enhancements to existing programs for elementary school students have you proposed under the new plan? I'm speaking specifically about children with learning disabilities. So, so first I would say uh, pre-K, we've been expanding um, pre-kindergarten programs. Those uh, pre-kindergarten programs are, are prioritized by the state so that, you know, there's a certain um, set of criteria that they come in when you have a limited number of seats. What this is going to do is increase the amount of seats we have dramatically, 67 new pre-K programs over the next three years, I think is the right uh, number. Uh, we also uh, understand that... Um, we need additional seats in early childhood in special needs, and so we are closing Kenmore Elementary School for the coming school year, reassigning those children elsewhere and opening a new uh, early childhood special education center at, the, at what will be next year, the former Kenmore Elementary School. Why is the tax increase based on the highest budget year of the plan? I'm sorry, Terry, you want to help me out on this one? I think this speaks to what you were saying earlier. We're, we're viewing this as we would do it one time. And, and so we know that they have presented a plan that has multiple year requirements. And so where that was how it was derived. Okay, now, thank you, Terry. Um, so the increase happens this year, but it's spent over multiple years. So they're not spending all of the money in the first year of the program. It's spent multiple years to get the impact. But this is, believe me, it's hard enough to get this one shot through. I can't imagine going back to the council, which we would have to by law and have them vote on a tax increase every single year. So it comes in this year, but he, the plan 
as outlined, would be spent over multiple years. The county faces many structural deficits from union contracts, pensions, fringe benefits exceeding 75%. Will this increase cause further structural deficits that will cascade to even greater structural deficits? On the county side, no, because we're cutting on the county side. So, uh, you know, we're, the, the unions that I'm dealing with are all mad at me. So uh, we're cutting and it will not, uh, not infect and not impact ours. Am I correct? Okay. Can you please further explain the difference in the tax rates in your proposal? If people already have lower property values, would they, they would pay less anyway. Why are the rates going to vary depending on zip code or area? If the 15 cents rate is an average or will it be applied across the board? No, no, the 15 cents is applied across the board. The impact that it will have on individuals will vary. If your house, that's why we had this chart up here uh, that shows if you have a house that's worth, Terry, show me if I'm right. If you have a house that's worth $100,000, then your, your property tax rate per year Additional tax would be $150. That's uh, $13 a month or 41 cents per day. If your house is worth 500000 then your tax rate, uh, additional taxes you will pay is 750 That's a year or $63 a month or $2.05. So it depends on what the value of your house or the assessed value of your house is. What the, but the amount, the 15 cents, is flat. It's 15 cents across the board. It just depends on where you live. That's why I said it will disproportionately affect people because if you're in those places, and it's part of the question, where you know they just can't afford it, a lot of those places um, are not going to be are not going to see their property taxes go up. Uh, if you have an assessed value of less than 100,000 or 90,000, you're not on the board. So, so your it, it's income and and assessed value, right? So, and just like if you're if you're a family uh, and you make less than sixty or what we're probably going to amend it to seventy, um, then you wouldn't be affected by this, or you have the homestead deduction. And the last question: Why didn't you include Baltimore County? in your propaganda sheet of county investments. Because in the propaganda sheet, uh, we looked at the Washington region because that's actually who we're competing against. But yeah, if, if we want to look at Baltimore County and what we should do in Baltimore County, because we should be where they are. Look at where they're ranked. They're, they're the middle to up. If you look at Baltimore County, and that's a good one, they have about the same population. I think they're, uh, they're, they're about, about 500, 400 square miles like we are. Um, income is roughly about the same as, as ours. Uh, education is about the same as ours. So we should be comparing ourselves to Baltimore County. Well, they're in the upper middle class of the, of the ranking. We're at the bottom of education, right, of education. So, but we didn't include them because the kids, the people that our kids compete against are right around here. The Washington region. The Washington region is now Anne Arundel, Loudoun, Montgomery, Fairfax, Howard, uh, uh, Alexandria, Falls Church, Arlington, Calvert, Manassas. But I will say this. Baltimore County was one of those jurisdictions that said, guess what? We're putting our money into our school system. And they were the loudest voice saying, you know what? Prince George's County, they make as much money as we do. They're as educated as we are. Why are we funding their education system? If they don't want to fund it, then why should you take money from us when we're putting money in? And that's why they passed the bill and said, you know what, if you guys really care about it, here's your opportunity. But that's why they're not immediately surrounding us. Uh, yeah. So that was the last question. As I promised, I will stay here until 
The nice where the maintenance people. Uh, until they come in and tell me they have to clear us out. So this is the point where we will call on you, and if you want to ask questions, you can do that. Um, I do want to say to Dr. Maxwell and Sagun Eubanks, since I do Dr. Eubanks, since I don't speak for them or they don't work for me, uh, they don't have to stay if they don't want to. So with that, uh, I am here and available. Yes. I'd like to say that our last education conversation is tomorrow at Tyak Elementary School. And I want to thank you all who are about to leave. We thank you so much for coming this evening. Want the rest of the audience to hear? Yeah. Okay. Um, as you a, as you quietly as you quietly right right so right well I, trust trust me so so the taxes in case you didn't understand it is not only the property tax I think I said this there's a telephone tax I think. Maybe you're out the room. So there's a telephone tax, there's a property tax, there's a business tax, and apartment owners will be taxed also. And a hotel tax. Yes. Do you know the difference in trim and with it, with it? taxes? Okay. Explain yes. the difference for right. the cameras. Explain the difference for the, well, that's our camera because, you know, you, I don't know if you want it, but okay. Yeah. So for the difference in trim and what? And voter approval of new taxes. Right. Two That's right. Two charter amendments. That were, there's trim and voter approved taxes. The legislature overrode that for education. So it allows us to do each one of these. For, I mean, uh, the legislature the legislature overrode it. We got an attorney general's opinion. And as I said in the beginning, you know, when I was in law school, they said state trumps local. Thank you. There you go. No, I probably was asleep on that one. Yes, ma'am. 